here again in this second uh, seminar of second Simba seminar. Our speaker today is Jaume de Dios. Uh, Jaume studied physics and maths at UAB, UAB, sorry, uh, he finished uh, three years ago. Then he moved to Zurich to do his master's at ETH. And now, since uh, September 2018, I guess, uh, he's a PhD student at UCLA uh, under the supervision of Terence Tao, who you may probably know. Uh, he's working in, in analysis and, and some related fields as well, when, uh, and not so related, like maybe a bit of number theory, a bit of probability. Uh, so, lots of things, and today he will give a talk called Decoupling and Applications from PDEs uh, to Number Theory. Thank you, Jaume. Thank you very much for the introduction, Clara. Um, and thank you to the organizers for letting me speak today. It's very nice to come back to Barcelona, like, at least even if it's virtually, and uh, speak here. So. Today, I want to talk to you about a tool that's been very important in modern harmonic analysis. Uh, not because it's a beautiful tool, but because it has a lot of applications. This tool is called the coupling, and I'll spend the first little part of the talk explaining you what the coupling is, but we'll mostly talk about its applications, because I think that's the most exciting part about uh, the coupling. So, the coupling is a tool to relate different functions which are supported in different frequencies. So you will have functions that are like waves uh, and you want to add them up and you want to understand when this uh, addition will have a constructive interference and when it will not. As you might imagine, such an estimate was actually invented um, to understand the wave equation better. So Tom Wolf in the beginning of the century, invented uh, this estimate or a variation of this estimate to show one of the key estimates for the wave equation that says that things, wave equations may blow up, but then they unblow themselves immediately after. And since then, it's been used in a lot of applications. And today, I'm going to talk about two of them. One of them, oh wait, yeah, it's not natural. Yeah, that's important. It's a weird estimate. We're going to see it and you're going to, like, the first time I saw it, I was a bit confused of why would that be relevant, but we'll, we'll go for it. And we're going to see two applications of this uh, estimate. One is to the Schrodinger equation by Burgen and Demeter. We're going to see that one of the most important estimates for the Schrodinger equation can be transformed into a decoupling estimate, and it's essentially equivalent to a decoupling estimate. And then to see something radically different, we will see how to solve what's called the main conjecture in the Vinogradov mean value theorem, which was a conjecture posed by uh, Vinogradov more than 80 years ago. And he found it while studying the Riemann zeta function. And it's very surprising for me that the solution to this uh, conjecture ended up being purely analytical without talking about numbers anymore and showing something that's much more general but then implies in a very particular case this conjecture. Just a big disclaimer, uh, the field is very technical and therefore I will omit tremendous amount of things. I will omit a lot of technicalities to make the talk palatable and to make it 40 minutes, but don't use any theorem that's presented on this talk without looking for the theorem actually in a paper because they might be technicalities, the definitions of the coupling might be slightly different and so on. But the theorems here either are expected to be true, um, but we don't know they're true, or there's just one little detail that would take us 10 minutes to explain that makes it almost true. So don't, yeah, just don't use these estimates without actually reading. Uh, Tao has a very nice blog post. His blog is in general like a great place to look at things. And he has one where he introduces the coupling uh, in a rigorous way, and you could go there. Uh, so let's go into what does this coupling estimate say. We start with the Fourier transform because that's the object we want to study. We want to look at functions with different frequencies and the way to like understand the frequency composition of a function is by looking at its Fourier transform. 
So we're going to look at a function f, which is going to be the sum of a lot of little functions fi. And our condition will be that the, each of the fi's will be supported in a certain nice set of rd. So we'll have rd, and then we'll have f1 maybe supported here, then f2 might be supported here. And then we want to know like how much constructive interference there is between those functions. Um, the way to do it will be by estimating certain LP norms. So we have this monster, which we're going to dissect in a second. We want to find an inequality that tells us that the sum, certain norm involving the sum of the functions is smaller than certain norm involving the functions themselves. Let's start with the left-hand side, just as a quick reminder of what the LP norm is. On an LP norm, you have an object, you power it to the P, and then you integrate, and then you do the one over P. It's like the discrete analog, but like for functions. Um, and then on the right-hand side, we have a bit more complicated object, which is a little LQ, big LP norm. This means that first we do the LP norm with respect to X, which is basically what I showed on the left-hand side. And then we do uh, a little LQ norm with respect to the index. So we do the LP norm with respect to X, and then we just do a sum, sum to the Q, to the one over Q. And in some sense, if Q equals one, then this is triangle inequality. But choosing larger Qs is harder and would give us more and more control over the relationship between the two functions. So essentially, we're always interested in the cases where both P and Q are larger than two. The P larger than two is somehow related to the fact that the Fourier transform is not bounded from LP to LQ if P is larger than two. And then it makes the whole estimate very intractable and we just don't do it. Um, now I'll show you like the canonical setting because I just talked about abstract sets, but let's go a bit more specific. In our canonical setting, you will have a parabola or a paraboloid or a curve or something like this, some very geometric object, and you will cover it up by little boxes. And you will choose like the smallest boxes that you can use so that you can cover it up. In this case, if we use the parabola, y equals, wow, well, y equals x squared, then we can cover it with these rectangles and parallel pipettes, which are just shifted versions of these rectangles. There's another way to cover the parabola if we want to restrict ourselves to a compact subset of the parabola, which is instead choosing subsets that have size delta here and size delta squared here by scaling the previous picture. And then we have delta to the minus one subsets so that this whole size is like approximately minus one to one. And these are going to be our examples. This is good. This example or variation of these examples are going to be important both in number theory and in partial differential equations for very different reasons. So now that we know about the examples, just like what's the decoupling estimate in this case? This is very typical in harmonic analysis and it's kind of a defect. We would like to show that this is smaller than or equal to one or than some big constant maybe, but due to the nature of the proofs, very often we cannot do that. And instead we have to just be satisfied by showing that it grows slower than any polynomial. And this should be a big N as well, otherwise it doesn't make sense. Um, so we would like to say it's constant, but the structure of the proof usually is not strong enough. And it's a very big open problem. When can you remove those things and when can you not? So let's omit that for now. Now that we've seen the example, I want to show you some properties of the coupling that made it particularly nice to study. Um, wait, the first one is that it's invariant under linear maps. If I have two sets here, and then I apply like a shear map or anything like that map that just shears the space, and like, then that doesn't change the coupling. That's because the Fourier transform and linear maps behave very, very well with respect to each other. So, and that also explains why we can consider the big parabola or the small parabolas before, because you can linearly transform from one to the other. So they have the same decoupling. And that's very important to simplify proofs because proofs have some sort of inductive setting all the time in some, using some tool that's called induction on scales. That goes as follows. So if I know how to decouple the parabola with M little pieces, like just break the parabola into M pieces and understand this inequality with M pieces, 
and I also know how to decouple it with n pieces, I also know how to decouple it with m times n pieces. And why would such an estimate be true? You can just zoom in. So we start with our previous parabola, and let's say that this has m pieces. And then we just zoom in into one of the pieces and put n pieces inside. And that, if you just repeated that for every single piece of the parabola, would give you m times n pieces. And by joining the two decoupling estimates you have, you would be able to get a new decoupling estimate. And that's basically how all the proofs work. You show the coupling for some finite pieces, and then you just like zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, and like transfer your decoupling to arbitrary high values of n. Um, and then there's a couple other fancier properties that I can't talk a lot about, but if you've seen anything in harmonic analysis, they might ring a bell. Uh, one of them is that it can be effectively multilinearized. What that means is that it suffices to understand the interaction between two pieces that are very far away. You can just look at pieces that are far away and then just add up all the contributions and that works out very well. And then the last reason why it's so useful is because it relates very well to the traditional tools in harmonic analysis. I mean, traditional, like from the last 30 years, we've had some tools that have worked very well, such as Kakia type estimate, uncertainty principles, wave packet decomposition, and they work very well with the coupling. Everything just kind of flows when you're trying to do a proof. And that's probably what has made it so like, relevant in the last year. So now that I've tried to sell you the coupling estimates, I'm actually going to do some applications. And that's what we're going to spend most of our time. So our first application will be to number theory. Let's look at this system of equations. It's a system of equations in two S variables. And we have K equations. And one may wonder, there's one very easy solution, which is x1 equals to x2 equals to xs equals to y1, y2, ys. So there are infinitely many solutions. So instead of counting the number of solutions, we want to count the number of solutions which have values smaller or equal uh, so x i y i smaller than some big value x and then we want to count the solution so to make it more precisely we call j s k x the number of solutions to this problem where x and y are not too big and from now on you can assume that s and k s are fixed and we have one system you don't have to consider the whole family of systems because that's much harder um, and then we have a very specific estimate that's this it's weird, again, we have the C epsilon x to the epsilon that we can never get rid of because of our proofs. And then we have something very strange. And turns out that this is reasonable and that up to this bad term, we know this is sharp. And that's what I'm gonna show you first. Like why would one expect such a weird estimate? And then we're gonna see how to relate it to the coupling problems. So we have to show that this is sharp. this sharp. So we have to find examples where the left hand side is comparable to the right hand side or like reasons why this would be true. So the x to the epsilon, as I said, probably shouldn't be there. Mm, we have to live with it. Mm, if someone knows how to remove it, they'll become probably very famous. And I think if you remove it optimally, you even have as a consequence the Riemann hypothesis. If you show the right constants and remove the x to the epsilon. So probably a very hard problem. Um, and then for the x to the s, we have a very particular kind of equations which are called diagonal solutions. You just pick each x and put it equal to each y. And then of course you're gonna have that sum of xi to the k equals sum of yi to the k because well, xi is equal to yi. And we have x to the s uh, solutions like this because we have x variables, we have x1 up to xs, this one, and each of them belongs on zero to big X. And therefore, we have at least by a combinatorial argument, we have at least x to the s solutions all the time. And then the weird term, the complicated term is this one. I can't show you why, but I can give you a very compelling argument. It's a randomization argument. The real argument is just a rigorous version of this argument. Um, so 
So what we're going to do is we're going to pick the x, the y's, and the y's at random. So we have x to the ts choices, the two s choices. And then we're going to ask ourselves, what's the probability that if we make a choice, then all the equations actually hold. And then by using this probability, we will kind of get an estimate on how many solutions there should be. So let's first look at what's the probability that the first equation holds. We have that x1 plus 1 plus xs minus y1 y minus ys. Since each of them is like x, then the sum is also comparable to x. It's like s times x, but s is small compared to x, because we're looking at large x's. And this sort of tells you that the probability that this um, equation actually holds is similar to 1 over x, because it's a random number between minus x and x. It's actually, you can show that it's more likely to get 0 than to get any other number. So the probability is at least 1 over x. Um, you can do this argument with the other systems uh, equations we had in the system as well. Now x1 squared plus x2 squared and so on minus the other ones is roughly between minus x squared and x squared. Um, therefore, the probability that if you choose numbers at random, you get this equation is at least 1 over x squared. That would be the uniform probability, but arithmetic doesn't actually go against you. It helps you out. So we get x to the minus 2 as well. And now, of course, you're going to get like x to the minus k in the general case, and you just join everything. The expected number of solutions is the number of choices times the probability that a choice gives uh, the right solution. So number of choices times the probability. We assume their independence. Then again, the rigorous, the rigorous proof essentially shows that they're not independent, but that each equation actually helps the following one. So you get like even a bigger um, inequality. And then you just sum everything. And like, of course, the sum of the consecutive numbers is this thing. And that explains why we should expect such a strange inequality to be true. Now, I'm going to relate this to a decoupling problem. Bear with me for a second. I'll put a very strange equation on the screen. And then I'll show that this equation is true. So this is called exponential sum sums. I know every step of it. It still feels like magic to me. Um, we have this property. Don't worry about this too much. We will go step by step on why would something like this be true. We're integrating in omega, by the way, in, uh, in the frequency. And then the j's are fixed. And let's pretend for a second we believe this. And we'll see later. And now I'm going to show how this, I mean, this already looks like a decoupling problem almost. Um, let's pretend we knew this and let's show that a decoupling estimate would imply this. So our fj's are going to be the things inside, because remember the coupling wanted to relate the sum, the LP norm of a sum to the individual LP norms. Then the fj norm is like this. And this lets you compute very easily the LP norm of fj, because this has absolute value equals to 1. And in particular, it's very easy to compute. Like LP norm of 1 is like integral of 1, so it's 1. Um, actually, it's, maybe it's, this is a 1, actually. Yeah. Um, then uh, each of the j squares is a single frequency. It's exactly one frequency, so it's supported on one point. And all those points are on a certain curve, which is called the moment curve, which is the curve t, t squared, t maps to t to the k. So we're going to do the same thing that we did with the parabola, but now we're going to build our decoupling estimate around this weird curve. And that was what Bourguin, Demeter, and Booth did in 2015. And um, basically what they say is that if you get this curve, then you look at tiny neighborhoods of this curve and you split them, split them into intervals so that like one fj is on each interval. Then we get this decoupling estimate where you see the same k, k plus 1 appearing. And then from here, it's just algebra. You just like plug in the norm of the fj's, plug in the norm of f, and you, you get this. You, you end up getting that this thing over here is 
smaller than or equal what you wanted, which was like uh, n, uh, sorry, x to the k plus x to the k, uh, sorry, uh, 2s. Am I doing this right? No, no, I'm not doing this right. X to the s plus x to the 2s minus k, k plus 1 over 2. Just by like plugging everything in and like doing a bit of algebra, it's not uh, like a difficult thing from here. But the hard thing is first, why, why would this be true? And second, proving this is extremely, extremely complicated. We have easier proofs now. So the proof of poor gain was the first one, but I believe like there is a proof by Zane Lee, for example, that's way, way easier than this one. So don't go to the poor gain one, at least at the very beginning, go read an easier one and then go to that one. And now we're going to see why this estimate over here is expected, is expected. But the first thing we'll do is look at a simpler integral. So let's say you want to check. Our goal will be to check whether some numbers, x1 to xs, y1 to ys, actually satisfy our equations. And what I say is that we can test this by looking at this integral. So we have a product of an exponential on the curve, like an exponential of the characters associated to each point. And then we just integrate this over the whole space. Okay, first thing, we have the products of exponential sum, so we can just do an exponential of a big sum with everything inside, and just rearrange everything to get this. So we put everything inside in a single exponential, and then we realize that we have a dot product. So we can sum over the component of the dot product and put that as a thing outside. Um, once we've just expressed everything, the minus sign comes from the conjugate, of course. And once we've done that, we can actually switch the product and the integral because each integral only depends on one component. So we switch everything and we're essentially done. We're integrating an exponential. When is this not equal to zero? If and only if the thing inside is equal to one, because otherwise the exponential will just oscillate and when you do the integral will cancel it. So this integral doesn't vanish if and only if the equation inside is actually held. So this is an indicator function that tells us this super weird integral we started with is nothing but an indicator function that tells us when the solutions are uh, actually hold, like when, when the xs and ys are actually hold. And what we're going to see now is that that LP norm that we were computing is just a way to sum over all possible values of the xs and ys's. And after summing, realizing, like just counting the ones where the equation is actually held. So let's do that step by step. So this was the thing that we wanted to prove that is equal to jsk of x. Um, we just write the definition. And remember that the absolute value of x to the 2s is x to the 2s, x bar to the 2s, if it's a, com a, 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 a complex number. So we write that. We split this absolute value into two different parts, right? Now we're very close to the equation we had before, except instead of a product, we have a weird sum. So the thing we do now first is expand this s power and just write this as a product of a lot of terms, like this, right? And now let's see what happens when I just brute force expand this product. When I brute force expand this product, I will choose x1, I will get like a lot of monomials. And for each monomial, I will have every possible value of x1, every possible value of xs every possible value of y1 and every possible value of yf. So I will be summing over all the possible values of x1 to xs, y1 and ys. And the monomial, the thing that I will be summing, is the product of the exponentials. So essentially what we saw before. And in particular, this is equal to jsk of x. And that's why you can turn a problem about um, number theory into a problem of estimating the LP norms of a certain um, function and then use the coupling to solve that problem. And you can actually see a lot more thanks to the coupling because 
you could like do weighted sums where you put some weight to each value of xi and say like I want to count solutions according to some weight and you just repeat the same estimate and it gives you like sharp estimates on how to count solutions with weights on them as well. So it's actually a much stronger estimate than what the number theorists were looking for. However, we lose the x to the epsilon, which is very bad for, from a number theory perspective. And we have absolutely no control on the constant. All those methods, you don't know what's the implicit constant in front. That C that you have, it disappears. It's, or I, I have a friend that tried to compute it and it's like E to the like 10,000. It's something you can't really work with. So this is the number theory side of things. And now I'm going to talk about uh, the Schrodinger equation. Just to see that the same type of estimate can have very like broad applications on different fields. Okay, so let's look at the Schrodinger equation. For the ones that are not familiar with it, the Schrodinger equation sort of tells you how the probability of a, the probability distribution of a particle evolves uh, with time. So you have a certain particle with a certain probability distribution in space because quantum mechanics is random, and then the Schrodinger equation tells you like how does this probability evolve with time? And it gives you a rule on how to like update this probability over time. And of course, you have to know where your particle started, the original probability distribution. Um, in the way physicists write this equation, there's usually like a Planck constant and so on. By suitable rescaling, you can get rid of the awful that and just get a nice equation that doesn't have any physical constant on it. Mm, we're gonna play with this equation a bit before even like trying to like estimate things. The first thing I want you to note is that we will we will look at u hat, which is the Fourier transform both in x and t. So I will Fourier transform over everything. That's a bit weird if you've seen PDEs before, but this perceived PD, this perceived PD is relies very heavily on this, at least at the beginning. Um, another thing I'm gonna do is I'll write it like this. Like I'll just bring the Laplacian to the other side. And now we can use properties like um, derivative, when you have a derivative and you wanna, of a function and you Fourier transform it, this is like uh, wt, the frequency associated to t um, you have. So on the Fourier side, derivatives become multiplications. And if you use this fact, you can turn this original equation into an equation that only has multiplications. So what this tells you is that if u hat is not zero, then this part has to be zero. And in particular, u hat is supported, like the whole support of u hat is actually a parabola or a paraboloid, which essentially brings us back to the coupling because the coupling was all about studying functions that were supported in a certain manifold. Another way of seeing that, uh, oh wait, no, here. Mm, now I'm going to talk about like what we want to prove. Like what's the kind of estimate that people care about? That's something called this Strickert estimate on a torus. So uh, we have our equation. Uh, we look at the equation on the torus. We don't look at it on the whole space. You can consider either a periodic original condition or like it actually living on a manifold that's the torus. This has, there's reasons to like study this in physical implications. And then the question that we have is, can we like estimate how big, uh, and this should be a u, how big u is as a function of how big the original data is more precisely in a way like this. So. Can we say that if the original data is small in L2, then the function at least for some time stays bounded in LP. If you've done some physics, you know that for P equals two, this is immediate. If you haven't, it's not necessary. But for P larger than two, this is definitely not an easy estimate. But we will transform it to a um, decoupling estimate. As always, there's some critical range of P's for which this work, and after these P's, there's some counterexamples that prevent everything like this from working. So, how would one go about proving something like this? Um, first, there's an explicit formula 
for our u of x, you can check that first, let's say if I look at t equals zero, then this dies, and then I recover phi of t, uh, phi, phi, phi of x, because this is like invert, doing the Fourier transform and then undoing the Fourier transform again. So the case, uh, so we have the initial condition and then you just have to check that each of these monomials actually um, follows the Fourier, uh, the, the Schrodinger equation and that just plug it in, compute the derivative, compute a Laplacian, and it does work. Okay, we're, again, we have a sum of functions. That's the setup of the coupling. You have a function, that's a sum of functions. We've already told that these functions have Fourier transform in a parabola or a paraboloid. You can just check like the frequency lives in a parabola or paraboloid. And again, we've been able to write our function as a sum of um, functions living in a geometric option, uh, object. Um, okay, so what can we do now? The first thing we have to do is compute the norm on the right hand side. Each of these uj's is something that's one times something that's phi hat j. In particular, its norm is exactly equal to phi hat j. And now remember that we have to compute the L2 LP norm for the coupling. The LP part we've done, and now we have to do the L2 norm. But the L2 norm of the phi hat j's, that's Plancherel. So it's the same as the L2 norm of phi. And therefore, the Strickert estimate can be transformed into an estimate about uh, the coupling. And now we just have to show, to show the Strickert estimate, we would have to show that the decoupling estimate, that the, the coupling constant is more or equal than C epsilon n to the epsilon. And that's how you turn a PDE problem, a pretty hard PDE problem, into the coupling problem. So that's it on my side. I realized I finished a bit early. Um, Bourguin and Demeter proved this decoupling estimate in 2014, and there's like a paper where they just do the whole thing. It's a bit more complicated because they're working simultaneously in the reals and the torus, and they have to go back and forth. Um, but they essentially proved this. Um, so yeah, that's basically everything that I wanted to show you. Essentially wanted you to get a glimpse that there's this weird estimate that can be used both like in very different areas of math to count things, to solve uh, estimates for certain PDEs. Of course, if you wanted to do restriction conjecture, the sharpest estimates right now don't use the coupling, but you could use the coupling. It's a pretty applicable tool of uh, harmonic analysis that's out there and that's been giving us very spectacular results over the past uh, 10, especially 10 years, yes. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions. Thank you, Jaume. Uh, it, it was a nice talk. There were a lot of things there, uh, a lot of connected things. Um, is there any question there? If, if any of you want to ask a question, want to make a comment, feel free to do it. Uh, if no one, I will. Uh, probably this is very uh, stupid, I don't know. Do you know if this, uh, the coupling techniques has been used for something useful uh, for stochastic partial differential equations? I have no idea, actually. Um, but so one of the things is that they're very, very linked to the LP theory and like, for example, if you, if you care about like some other regularity, it's, it's hard to use them. I, I can't give you a reference, but I've definitely seen power products and decoupling somewhere. Okay, uh, but okay. no, I, I can't give you, I can't, I really can't give you like, it, in principle, like, uh, it shouldn't be impossible, uh, but I haven't seen that. I feel like decoupling is like kind of the, this tool you use when you want to find very, very fine estimates on uh, objects that we've spent so many years working on and we already knew so many things about. Like in SPDE, sometimes like you, you, the bigger problem is almost like getting what's going on. Like it's like such a new field. That's no, but for, for example, in my area, we use a lot like 
Fourier transform, like Plancher's yeah. identity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, no, no, it, it's definitely possible. Like, I feel like a bit of the thing with the coupling is that it's very new. It's we're getting newer proofs now. Like a lot of the things that were proven in the mid 2010s are being reproven now because the first proofs are scary. At least like I consider them a bit scary. And that makes it hard for people who are not experts in harmonic analysis to use these techniques. Like for a while it was like Jean Bourguin just doing the coupling and everyone just looking and admiring what Jean Bourguin was doing. And so I'm sure I'm, I'm like I'm sure there's there will be applications. It's just I can't come up with one now. It's been like very like harmonic analysis, like kakia kakia type problems. Yeah, but I, I I would be very excited to see those though. Okay, thank you. Are you working on decoupling? Uh yes and. No, like, okay, I, I I'm, I'm about, like, hopefully in two weeks, I'm, I'll get a problem with some friends on the coupling on the archive about what happens when you want to decouple counter sets. Like, your open sets are a certain level of a counter set. So that's one of the current projects that I have on the coupling. And then I have another one, which is a bit on the bigger picture of my research, which I've also been working on, which is about, um, how does the coupling constant depend on the geometric object that you've chosen? Like, for example, you could have a very large family of curves. That's, let's say, like you're, you're, you're looking at curves gamma from R to R2. Um, and then you want to split them into boxes and then do the, decou the decoupling of gamma. You want to uh, decouple gamma. And then you wonder, like, what's the relationship between the curve and the constant? Can I find families of curves? for which the decoupling constant is independent of the curve? Or like if you went to the PDE world, like can I find families of PDEs that are uniformly bounded? Things like this. So I've been working on uniformity of uh, different operators, not only the coupling, but the coupling is certainly one of the operators I've been working on. So yeah, I do have like, two ongoing projects on the coupling right now. Cool, thanks. Any more questions? One question. Um, about so, this, uh, yeah. Sure. What can you say about this Cantor set? Like, why, why, why would you be interested in, in this related to the coupling? So, it all started. There is a paper by, uh, wait, I don't have, yeah. There's a paper by Kirsty Biggs. <coughs> okay, there's a whole story. Like, yeah, now, now I have to talk a bit about the like history of the coupling and so on, where she does the Vinogradov problem. She's a number theorist. And she does the Vinogradov problem, but uh, for certain numbers that are missing digits. Like she, she warned us like what happens if I constrain on certain digits. And removing digits is equivalent to building associated counter sets. And there's, so the people uh, in number theory, there's like a whole story. There was this uh, professor, Trevor Woolley, that was working very hard for a long time on, um, on the Vinogradov problem. On the, and he solved it m almost months later um, than Borgen and Demeter and Goethe did. And the proof that he gave was, I feel a bit cleaner. And there's been a lot of connection going on between number theorists and people in harmonic analysis, trying to see whether you can translate proofs in one field to the other, what's the equivalence between tools. We're using very different tools. Like there's some tools that they use and some tools that we use that we don't even know how to translate to the other person's field. And um, in order to try to like establish more connections, we've been trying to write analogs on one side and the other of the papers and trying to see what, uh, what can we say? Like, can we find shorter proofs on one side? Uh, do the proofs become different? Like, for example, proofs in the coupling always end up having a very geometric flavor. And like, how does this geometry translate to the number theory side then? Um, so this, like the motivation to work on counter sets came from there. And then like, usually like as it happens, like as we were working on it, we, we realized that there were like a lot of things that were interesting on its own, new takes on the coupling that's like, we, we now, for example, can do like computational uh, approach, like 
computational proofs of what those of like bounds to those decoupling constants. Like we can get very precise bounds by performing computations and a lot of interesting things showed up afterwards. Hopefully this will be on the archive in a couple of weeks so you can see. Okay. Um, Any more questions? So then Jaume, you, you recommend us uh, to, to explore the coupling, to use it in our research, whatever field it is, I mean, as far as I understood, uh, right? If you're doing number theory, definitely uh, it's good. Or maybe if, if you're doing number theory, you might want to look first at like Trevor Woolley's tweet. Um, 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 efficient, it's called efficient. Because they do the coupling, but they don't call it the coupling, and they use tools that are more related to the people in number theory. And if you're, um, this is for people in number theory, and if you do harmonic analysis, definitely go to just look up uh, like Terry Tao. Like if you write on Google, Terry Tao, uh, the coupling, that's the name of his blog. You will find a set of nodes that has like the right amount of complexity so that you can learn what's going on without having to like be like, just like get a 150 page paper straight away. Uh, and yeah, if you're doing either number theory or harmonic analysis, it's definitely worth having a look at it. Uh, for example, like going through your research, I, I would have a very, very hard time thinking about how to apply this to your research, Clara. Uh, my, my, my particular- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like your personal <laughs> research, like I, I definitely like, I, I don't know if I should recommend you personally to read this because like, your research doesn't really intersect with this. Don't worry, don't worry. Uh, it's, it's fine as well. But anyway, uh, thank you for the information, Jauma. Mm. Okay, so I don't know if there's anybody else who wants to have any, to make any more comment or whatever. If not, uh, let's thank Jauma. I don't know if we can uh, clap our hands, putting on the the microphone or, or whatever. Or if not, let's just uh, thank you on behalf of, of everyone, Jauma, uh, and and see you soon. I hope. Hopefully. <laughs>